Welcome. I'm Peter Spence, your host with the Negotiation Channel today. And I have the pleasure of speaking with Lewis Orr, who is a global negotiation expert. And we'll be speaking about how and why we should be using consensus and, and negotiation strategies and uh, skills to advance the interests of diverse stakeholders involved in the mining and natural resources sector. Lewis is the founder of the Arasi Consulting Group. He is a mediator, consensus building and stakeholder engagement practitioner, negotiation consultant, conflict coach and trainer. He holds a Master's of Conflict Management from ICM Lipscomb University and negotiation training from the Program on Negotiation at the Harvard Law School. Lewis is a lawyer from Luma University. He helps individuals, groups, organizations, and governments use negotiation and consensus building skills and strategies to advance their interests, improve business and working relationships, and to deal more effectively with conflict. Lewis was the former Deputy Secretary of Conflict Management with the Prime Minister's Office of Peru during the transition emergency government in 2021. He is a peace builder with Mediators Beyond Borders International, a listed facilitator in the Inter-American Development Bank's Independent Consultation and Investigation Mechanisms roster, a mediator for the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman, Independent Accountability Mechanism for Projects, supported by the International Finance Corporation and Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, a private sector arms of the World Bank Group. Lewis is a senior partner with the Consensus Building Institute, the Latin America Director with Workplace Fairness Institute of Canada, and a director of Arasi Consulting Group, as well as the managing partner of Stratus Consultors Peru. Lewis was the chair of the Association for Conflict Resolutions International section in the US, and he was also the former chair, vice chair, sorry, of the American Bar Association's International Investment and Development Committee. Hello and a warm welcome to you, Lewis. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Peter. Lewis, that was quite an impressive track record involved in the field of negotiation and consensus building. I wonder if you might be able to share with me your, your backstory in relation to how you become involved in negotiation and were supported in your journey in this field. Okay, that's kind of easy. Because when I was in high school, my father gave me to read the book Get Into Yes, written by Roger Fisher and William Urey. Then finished high school, went to law school, and when practicing law, I realized that the court system produces winners and losers, not winners and winners. So as we know, there are three main ways to address and resolve conflicts, using power, which refers to the use of power and force as lever to force or coerce someone to do something, or adjudicating rights, which is what we do in the court system. So the parties seek to refer to an independent norm with the perception of legitimacy to claim what is correct or who's right and who's wrong. And the third way to address and deal with conflict is reconciling interest. So the parties try to satisfy their interest, concerns, desire, fears, what worries or what they want. And that's the only way, from my view, to reach mutual gains agreements, meaning win-win solutions. So I come from a developing country and in developing country, people don't trust in their core system. And I believe in the individual capacity to decide what's best for oneself. So I went to the US after practicing law in Peru, I went to the US, learn English and work on my great, great Grad, grad studies. So I learned there is also a way to satisfy multiple interests and strategies and processes to create mutual gains for parties involving complex situations. So considering, considering that Peru has a lot of foreign investment projects, a lot of mining, um, there's a lot of uh, poverty as well in the Andes region mainly, uh, where the projects mm -hmm. are. And there are a lot of conflicting situations. So I said, well, maybe it's time to get back to my community. And I came to Peru 
and start uh, working on this uh, in this field. So that's kind of the short version. That's wonderful. It just shows, it just shows a commitment to uh, your uh, area of, of expertise in negotiation consensus building. So I understand from your work that you've been heavily engaged in the mining and natural resources extraction sector. And this is an area that's subject to significant conflict amongst multiple stakeholders from different backgrounds with diverse interests. Would you please provide a brief description of this work? Okay, well, I, I have different hats for my roles. As a consultant, I help organization devising how to better engage with multiple stakeholders and practice conflict prevention due diligence to create the conditions to build trust and manage connections. So I help people connect with le uh, local leaders uh, to share the interest in implementing an investment project, learn about the interests of local communities, have sincere curiosity to engage, learn about the influence circles. Um, but in my work, what is key is to do stakeholder assessments to have a clear sense who the parties to a conflict are, what their interests might be, what is the likelihood of success of a dialogue process, or even perhaps there is a need for a different process or intervention. But I also work as a mediator, meaning as a neutral independent third party, and I'm called in to facilitate understanding among multiple parties or design and facilitate a dialogue process or a consensus building process. Then I help to reframe conversations, change the course, the course of a conversation, turn blame games or debates into constructive dialogue and help find better ways to engage and integrate multiple interests. I'm also called in to assess or evaluate social performance or community relation units of companies. And I also call I'm also calling to develop conflict management systems or units, either in companies or governments, uh, who wants to address more constructively conflict. That's kind of what I did with the Peruvian government in 2021, and I was managing more than 100 dialogue tables in the country. Then I was having some conversations with the Ecuadorian government, but at the end they changed uh, officials and didn't fly the project. But I also, part of my time, I do it training and coaching on stakeholder engagement and complex negotiation with multiple stakeholders. That's a, quite, a comprehensive, quite a comprehensive uh, skill set that uh, leads into uh, supporting stakeholders in this industry. And really, it, it it touches upon those diverse stakeholders that are involved as well, how you engage with those particular stakeholders and identify the stakeholders. Could you uh, just share me, with me just briefly of what, what we should be looking at or who should be involved as stakeholders in this mining and extraction industry? Who has a stake in the outcomes of developments or consultations? Well, the people who have a stake are, I mean, who should we reach out? Are the people who has an interest or that believe that might be impacted by a project, or people who has to be part on taking decisions around or making decisions around a, a project and who needs to be involved to implement those decisions. But we also need to engage the people who might block any decisions. Uh, and also we need to engage people who may have uh, resources or information or knowledge about the situation. That's if you are asking me who we, should we involve in, in, in a stakeholder assessment kind. Exactly. <laughs> who and uh, why we should involve those parties in the process? Who has, who has a say in the process as well? Who can impact the process? And also who is impacted by the process? So that was, that was quite well covered. Lewis, as we know, engaging and building a, a relationship with our counterparts is essential for effective negotiation. What advice would you give to a negotiator who seeks to engage and connect with stakeholders from different backgrounds? Yeah. The key is to connect with others as human beings. We are people. So 
it's also key building trust by listening and being genuine with the purpose of understanding the other, not to refute, not to, to have a debate. So, and we also need to have the, the right mindset, meaning we need to be sincerely curious to learn about the other person as a person and how he or she may see the world. So we need to be able to suspend interpretation from observation when we see different situations or, or unfamiliar behaviors. And a powerful tool to do this is, is something called the ladder of inference that help us to proactively listen to understand the other party perspective. So we can have a better sense of the information or data they are looking at, how they are making sense of it, or what kind of interpretation interpretation they provide and what conclusions they come up with or based on their own reasoning. And a key, I think a key guiding principle is to act with respect. I always say respect with double T. Um, T of treatment, so let's treat us as equals, and T of transparency, which deals with integrity. So don't lie to me or walk the talk. If you say you will do A, do it. And if you say you are not going to do X, then don't do it. So fulfill your promises and, and don't let me down. Don't let me down. So it's fundamental also to focus on emotional concerns or emotional interests, like appreciation. Everybody wants to, or everybody needs to feel appreciated and respected, or the sense of belonging or affiliation. Everybody wants to be part of something. And we also have the sense of, or the interest of autonomy because people don't want decisions to be imposed. That's, that's it. That was, that was <laughs> really and it resonates with me in relation to the uh, use of effective communication, active listening, seeking to understand so that you can be understood. And the other issues around respect, trust and integrity, the point of, of appreciating the other party, that they're seeking to understand them, that they feel that they've been heard, they're being listened to, and they're being appreciated and valued. That draws down the defensiveness uh, when you're negotiating. So that, that were really good points that I've picked up from there as well. Thank you, Lewis. So building upon that area around communication, as we know, communication is negotiation and negotiation is communication. Communication is basically the, the negotiation of meaning between parties involved. So what do you consider to be, to be the key elements of communication for effective negotiation? Right, yeah, you're, you're right on the spot because negotiation is a back and forth communication process for the purpose of reaching a joint decision. And one of my favorite quotes uh, from this book, Getting to Yes, is uh, it says something like, whatever you say, you should expect that the other side will almost always hear something different. So it's key to have a clear and precise communication to prevent misunderstanding. So we need to be conscious about the precise words we use. Words are powerful and word choice is also key. I remember a process uh, in which I was serving as mediator in which after a year of dialogue, parties reach an agreement to work together to study, to evaluate the economic potential of the subsoil of the territory of an indigenous community, which in other words is mining exploration. And we frame it as a joint exploration and, and that's how it worked. So we need to be precise with the words we use. We need to make sure that the message is received as intended. How we do that? Paraphrasing and verifying if the other one hear the message we wanted to communicate. And we also need to uh, be aware or we need to craft our messages and then that, that then will be unpacked. But we need to be sure that we design the, the messages considering the audience or the recipients and who and, and how they will hear the message and what interpretation they will give to it. And as many know, we uh, have 93% 90, of our communication is non-verbal. So the way we act is key too. So the way we look, eye contact or not, depending on the culture, our facial expressions, our gestures, our postures, even how 
the, what, the kind of objects we use or body language. I remember once uh, I was helping a company get to a community and, and, and this general manager, well, the manager of community, the uh, community engagement, we went to the ground and he was wearing a huge Rolex and we were going to a very poor area. And, and then I realized when we just get into the, the, the big meeting, like, hey, dude, you can now wear that. <laughs> so, and, and even we don't have to be ugly in our interaction. For instance, even if you are going to say no to something, you can say no with respect or with care. So, and, and I think we also, we can also say, can say no in a positive way. We need to recognize the other's interest and explain our interest and, ex and being precise to what we are saying no. Because if you say yes, you will not be taking care of your own interest. So that, that's why it's important not talking based on, on positions in this is what I want or this is my demand, uh, but we really need to care be careful and, and mindful and purposeful to understand the, the underlying interest of people, what they really care about, their needs, their fears, the concerns, the worries. And, and I think that's key in communication. Again, a couple of key takeaway points from there as well. We, we talk about um, the importance of that positive no, where it actually also at the same time conveys that appreciation that the other party has been heard. Uh, they're, you know, they're validating, not agreeing with, but validating uh, their interests and concerns, but understanding their concerns and how you can then shift that across to the yes in your conversation. That's a good point. And I think, as you mentioned before, the semantics, the uh, you, how you speak, uh, how you, you come into the same level uh, of the parties you, you're dealing with, understanding what's important to them, how you portray mm -hmm. yourself. It's really what I would call it is eliminating the negotiation noise out of communication. It's taking out uh, your semantic and your psychological noise, as you mentioned before, those issues around bias and, and appearances, and also where you're situated, the physical noise, where people feel comfortable where you're setting that up. So those are some really uh, good takeaway points. So uh, I really appreciate that. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you. So again, my next question is, when we are working with other parties who have different interests, what do you consider the key steps to integrating those interests into creative solutions? Yeah, I think uh, a fundamental point is that we need to set the, the right tone and frame the task at hand as a joint effort. So we have a challenge together, which is we need to create value, as much value as we can. And to do so, we need to understand the different the difference between interests and positions, and, and I was saying uh, seconds ago. So we need to be clear about our own interest and be able to prior, prioritize them, ours and, and also theirs. Because once we have the interest on the table, this is kind of the raw material to craft smart, intelligent, creative, sustainable agreements. <clears throat> so, we can unleash creativity by separating, separating, inviting from deciding. Meaning, once we have the interest clear, we can set a time to think together, brainstorm multiple ideas or potential options to satisfy those interests. First, we will create many ideas and then we will decide based on some sort of objective criteria. And we also need to know that we will not get all what we want, but that's why it's important we need to prioritize because we have to be better off than what we were before we engage in a in a negotiation. Terrific. Now, I think, uh, again, there's some key takeaways there at the same time. I like that approach where you were talking about uh, developing that common fate with uh, people as well, that uh, their interests will be best served by a, a certain purpose or objective, so they'll bring them on board to work together and how they integrate those particular interests uh, that they can do much better together uh, than what yeah. they can achieve alone and out of those outcomes. So that, that was yeah. really important. Wonderful. So uh, well, take us back, and this is where it comes back to your work as well, Lewis. Many of the groups you work with enter negotiations with grievances 
high emotions, low trust, and they tend to adopt a more competitive and adversarial approach to negotiation. So in these circumstances, what advice can you provide to facilitate a shift toward more collaborative negotiations and problem solving? Yeah. Some, some people say that God give us two ears and one mouth because we need to listen twice than what we speak. And the key is listening. So we need to let people steam off, take the things that they have out of their chest. So people will not listen to you until they feel feel and know they were heard or, or listened to. So listen, showing care and that you really want to understand what is important for them. Like high emotions like anger normally are second emotions. What, what trigger this? Uh, most likely an unmet expectation or an unmet need or interest. And we need to learn more about the other. And to do so, we need to listen. So we need to reframe our engagement from adversarial or blame games to collaboration and problem solving. So we should not be see each other as enemies, but as partners, as partners to address the challenge, the challenge at hand. So we have to listen to understand with genuine curiosity, as I said earlier, and listen with care. And make mm -hmm. sure the other feel and believe you care to understand the other perspective. Uh, of the situation and what you really want and that you really, really want to understand. And because you want something from them, you want to obtain or gain something from them, them uh, they need to know that you believe it's fair for them to gain too, so that they should gain and obtain something from this interaction. As you said, it's, it, it, they need to see that it's good for them to have this conversation. And they need to they need to sense and believe that it's in their best interest to work with you to address these uh, grievances because you may be able to help them to satisfy those grievances and they that they have or satisfy the interests that are important for them. So yeah, I I, I remember I I have a. Um, I have a, a. I was involved in a project uh, in which I was asking about the community. I, I was asking the community about this potential investment project, and some somebody says that no, they need to get out, out of here. We don't want them. And and I ask them, uh, so can can we can you get more things uh, together? with the company, that the things that you could get by yourself individually. So are we better off working together? And, and, I, and I did a little exercise and I said something like, let's assume for a second that there's no conflict or the conflict was resolved. So we did a, a visioning exercise and I said, if there were not conflict, how would you like to see your community in the future? And then they start talking about the education, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, roads, uh, improving their, their schools. And, and after all this conversation, okay, we start talking about how can we get the money to do this, right? And, and then they realize, well, maybe the company can, can, can help us to do this. So it's, it's, it's basically engaging with the other and see that it's convenient for them to at least try to work together and see if there's something that 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 can leave them both uh, better off. So, yeah. I would like that. Again, it comes back to that, seeking to understand and generally seeking to understand uh, and take into account the interest of all the parties involved. I think, as you mentioned in that last uh, case as well, when you've you've got people with with differences, is p coming up with that ideal state of really identifying what's important to them, what's the outcome they'd like, and then and shifting that discussion away from problems and conflict to really, uh, sorry, away from, from the people issues and the conflict, really towards the problem. How do we get there? We know what the ideal uh, outcome would be. 
how we achieve that. And this is where the options can be generated and they start to work side by side. So I really like the way you explained that and how you went about it. So yeah. terrific. Thank, Thank you, you, Lewis. Thank you. So again, the other issue we can look at, which is really important, is around the power imbalances. When you've got traditionally some stakeholders have got uh, enormous power, power over resources and the other issues, some uh, in effect have uh, weaker areas of power. So certain disparities or, and uh, imbalances in the strength and sources of power amongst the multiple stakeholders when they're trying to, you know, when they, these create challenges to negotiation. How do you facilitate consensus building amongst parties who have different power? Yeah, I, I I strongly believe that good process give or provide good results. And it's true, sometimes you get uh, parties, some may have more social power, others may have more economic power or, or deeper pockets. And, and it's important helping them balancing the field uh, with, with the right processes. For instance, bringing information and expertise to serve the process and, and both parties. For instance, there's a process called uh, joint fact finding in which we define what information we have, what information we don't have, what information we need and how we are going to get this information. So we can prepare this process, define kind of the scope of what we want to study. Uh, we bring experts that will serve both parties. It's not like a, in the court system that you have a, an expert defending one cause mm. and the other expert defending another cause. So you bring a set of experts. It's like like an interview process. Say, we want to gather this information. How should we do it? And the expert will give you the information of what was the most appropriate methods of analysis and then they conduct this study, they evaluate it, and then they provide the, the results to both parties. And then parties will, will decide uh, based on the information. The experts will not make the decisions, but will provide the information that, that is needed to make informed decisions. Um, there, there's a, a case, and there's a video of a case from a colleague in, in Chile that they were doing a, an energy project, and the company... So the local community was not well educated, I guess, uh, and the company pay uh, a marine biologist expert to advise the community to better understand the environmental environmental impact assessment, and also the company pay uh, an attorney or hire an attorney, a lawyer, but to help the community to negotiate with them. It's not a, an attorney with an adversarial mindset, oh, we're going to suit this company, but the company pay for this lawyer and the lawyer help the, the community to to negotiate uh, an agreement with, with, with this energy project. I like that. It's really brings us back to the... Uh, the training and negotiation around the use of objective criteria and fair standards. So really what you're bringing, it's accepted by the parties involved. It's independent, it's objective standards that we involve. So it, it's absent of the power and it's absent of negotiating over will and emotions of this much or power and more so in relation to merit of, of the particular arguments that balance the power as well. So I really like that uh, that key point that you've raised there as well. And, and again, as we know with power, um, it, it comes back to uh, different parties. Some are unaware of the power, power that's available to them. Traditionally, you'll have people with resources, resource right. power over, legitimate power. That's a power over, and that can be finite. But as you know, with different groups where they develop alliances or other groups there as well, they, they have power with, they've got other sources of power. Knowledge you mentioned before, tapping into that so i really uh i like your view on those particular areas around how you deal with power um and we can unpack that a little bit later as well if we've got time <laughs> wonderful so lewis this is really comes to the nitty-gritty of, of uh negotiating in these particular areas particularly when you've got um global companies uh, working across different areas geographies amongst different cultures and also different professions, and we've talked about that as well. So cross-cultural negotiation, it, it appears inherent in the field of extractive resources. 
with multiple stakeholders from different backgrounds, including government, corporate, mm. community, and importantly, Indigenous representation, a lot of these areas where mining takes place. So what are the key issues to consider when we approach these types of cross-cultural negotiations? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because everybody feels that their group, their region, they are they are super different than the rest, or they are unique. Every individual, every person is 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 beautiful and is unique uh, as a creation, as human beings. Um, but it's key to build positive working or trustworthy relationships, and 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 to do this, I think that we really need to express appreciation, build that affiliation that we were talking earlier. We need to respect that autonomy and we need to suspend judgment, especially with when we're dealing with unfamiliar behaviors. So we need to be mindful and being aware of, of cultural and personal assumptions that, that people have. So, and we need to be sincerely curious about to, to learn about the other and obviously respect differences. Differences. So in general, paying attention to these cultural differences, um, re cultural issues, respecting differences, learning about the communities, honoring uh, local cultures, appreciating others' identity, acknowledging emotions, and framing foreign investment as a mutual beneficial opportunity, and, and an, in uh, an engagement stakeholder uh, and engaging stakeholders in decision-making processes, I'm sure it will build trust. Uh, the trust that is required to have these projects. So, and, and to inspire trust, one must shape expectations. So investors can have a chance to, to shape the local uh, community's expectations and perceptions by engaging the communities directly with honest and open dialogue to address the issue of distrust. And, and, and I guess it's because my field, my work, open dialogue to have, um, like mm -hmm. companies should open dialogue to have members of local communities uh, voice their views or of risk and grievances and find ways to satisfy the concerns, fears, and, and needs and aspirations that people have. So we are humans, and we just need to connect with people. We're all here. You're, you're quite right. And uh, yet we have so much diversity in our values and our perspectives from our life's experience, but also our culture as we, we come along as well. I like your point there about really seeking to understand, making an effort to learn, listen. We go back to that listening and learning and respect the, the, the different parties. I think that's a, a key issue. If anyone is considering that their views uh, are discounted or they're not being heard, uh, their autonomy is impinged upon and their values are impinged upon and their very identity is impinged upon, that can really uh, uh, make negotiations come unstuck. And, and no doubt the mining sector uh, and the natural resources sector are littered with failures that have come up where, where deals, good deals have unraveled because of that lack of engagement, the authentic and genuine interest in all the parties to be involved. And particularly when we talk about First Nations people, but also other communities and government, once that's discounted or not understood and people just go and expect everyone's going to respond in the same cookie cutter approach, right. it won't work. Right. And, uh, right. and yeah. yeah. So I think, sorry. I, uh, no, I was just going to say, I think that is undervalue uh, the listening or the importance of listening because uh, I have a, a friend from Spain and he say, well, listening, how he explained, listen is not waiting on a line to speak. And mm. we don't realize that we have second voices, like we are listening and we have second voices. And people may say or think, I don't have a second voice. Well, that's your second voice telling you that you don't have a second voice. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So you have you you mentioned we have all this noise around the communication uh, in the negotiation process, but yeah, and even though it's so important listening, we don't have at least in Peru we don't have uh, uh, courses or classes in school about listening. It's just writing, uh, giving a speech, but not about listening. That's spot on, and I, 
and it's not only in in Peru; it's right across the world. In and I think that's something we could even our negotiation, but listening skills in schools right throughout the world would would bring us to a better place. And uh, but I I go back to that point around that that area of of listening to parties as well. It's really so important to understand other parties from different backgrounds really look to learn. I think that the point there is, as you mentioned before, which is a key point, people say, oh, listening, it, it's waiting your turn. But what you're doing is waiting your turn. You're not thinking, you're not really listening to the party involved. Um, you're hearing, but you're not listening to what they're, right. they're involved in. And you're just preoccupied with getting your point across or how you're going to persuade yeah. that other party to come across yeah. to your side. Yeah, Take the time to truly understand it gives you that intelligence of the other party in relation to their interests, their values, their needs, or the options that could be available. It's so rich. And I'm, unfortunately, a lot of people want to just speak for the sake of speaking to get their point across yeah. and go out. And that's where we'd lose it. So uh, yeah. I think that was a, a great point there as well. Um, now, we're going back, I, I, I particularly, I, I want to go back to the issue of power, if we could. Uh, we've got a little bit of time as well, Lewis. So the idea of power, and again, we talk about different sources of power. And could you provide examples when we talk about those different stakeholders and traditionally when you see those differences as sources of power? And, and uh, for instance, you, you have local communities that traditionally wouldn't look at, uh, you know, feel as if they've been disempowered. Right. Uh, or indigenous communities where they feel they've been disempowered, uh, but they have different sources available. And again, the corporates and government have got different areas as well. Could you perhaps unpack it just a little bit in that area of saying, well, right. what, how it affects people in those different uh, stakeholders? <clears throat> well, if, if you feel that you are powerless, uh, it's not very likely that you're going to see sit and talk with somebody that you see as the enemy because they are going to just hammer me, you may think. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's very difficult to have direct negotiations between a powerful and a powerless uh, person. So that's why I think it's key the intervention of a mediator who can mm -hmm. manage the process and, and, and bring balance. Uh, for instance, uh, sometimes people may not know that they have uh, rights and, and they are fearful and or, or the company is going to come and, 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 and pollute the environment or, or, or damage my water. And people may know or should know that there are rights or the, the legal system provides some, uh, I don't know, either mitigation or prevention stuff that will, uh, that could heal that fear, I may say. Uh, but in the process, in the mediation process, you can bring all that information. And, mm -hmm. and I think when people feel safe, they are more open to talk. And when they realize that, oh, the other guy is listening, they may really care about what's important for me, they will be in a, in a better, uh, with a better attitude to engage. So, yeah, I think that the, 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 I mean, when there are power imbalances, it's key to have a third party who can <clears throat> define a process that is, uh, that give you the sense of, 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 of safety. That resonates with me. I conducted an interview uh, just recently, and that issue of having a, a, a party that goes with you into the negotiation presence, whether it's a mediator to help you as well, or a coach or the other aspects, but having someone that's there with you as well to help balance that power out, that you're not alone. It's much more difficult to, to negotiate for yourself than what it is for others. And that's because right. of the emotions involved at, at the yes. same time. So yes. when you mention that, I think that's a really a key point to think about bringing someone along. And then we talk about, because a lot of people haven't got the confidence in their negotiation ability or, or their thoughts about power. And all of a sudden it's that when you've got that defeatist attitude before you go in to that particular area, you automatically devolve to that intrinsic approach to negotiation, which is competitive, the defensiveness, and that just escalates the uh, the emotions. But that just happen, doesn't happen to communities or indigenous groups. It also can happen with uh, uh, corporates and other particular areas yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say that 
maybe the problem for our engagement is that, that we are, we have this competitive mindset. And since we are kids, if you don't cry, you don't get the boob of your mommy to milk, right? <laughs> so if you go to Walmart or any store and the kid is like, daddy, daddy, give me the key, give me the candy, give me the candy. And the father is going to, okay, here's the candy. So we train our kids to act that way. Mm -hmm. So, and when you have a company saying, hey, you community relation person, go and put out that fire or put off that fire. And this is the amount of money. You have your 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 top and your bottom line and, and fix this, right? But there are not internal process of how we are going to engage this because a negotiation is not a, a, a task to go and do X. It's more mm -hmm. like a, a learning process in which you go, you talk with the person or the individuals, you share your interests, you listen to the other interests, you go back to the company and say, hey, if these are our interests as a company and these are the interests of the community, what can we come up with that could satisfy both parties' interests? Because if people are not satisfied with the result of a negotiation, they will find the first reason to not fulfill that compromise or that agreement. So it's not philanthropy to learn to to wanting to learn about the other one interest. It is convenient for us that they are somehow happy. Yeah. Mm. And that comes back to realizing that a successful agreement has to take on board all the interests of people involved. The everyone we influence one another, and that's that circular response. And we shape the the deal at the end or the agreement at the end. Everyone's influenced. They've all got a party to that as well. And I think that's a key key message that you've just brought across. I uh, also like the idea we, we take it back to those other parties involved, but the importance of um, building up a competency uh, with all parties involved. And I'll, I'll just touch on that in a, in a second of how I'd like to get your opinion on how we could do that. But it's really around that uh, confidence, whether it's in coaching uh, really acting as a third party and the media, the other issues, when we come together with those diverse parties, what, if, if someone was going to lead the process, what would you do as far as a project and it's an extensive process to look at uh, around leading this particular process, building up the competency, the confidence to people so they can come together and they can work together and sort out their differences and also look at developing options and, and shape the agreement? Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure if I understood your question, but I want to, you made me think something that years ago, I, I read an article that was in the labor union uh, field and said the title was like, what, what do we need to teach the other side to negotiate? And I think that before going to a, a, a a negotiation process which involves multiple stakeholders, it would be wonderful if we can do some training to the people so people realize that how we approach conflict, what's the best way to address conflict. Let's talk about interest and not have this competitive negotiation or adversarial negotiation. So one way to get better or, or have better results in, in a dialogue process is to first um, train people in collaborative negotiation on interest-based negotiation or mutual gains negotiation. Uh, I, be, I, I, I strongly believe if people in the whole world knew just the difference between talking based on interest and talking based on positions, that would be a whole different thing. You've got my mind ticking over as well, Lewis. And I, th I think about when you're coming into a, a large project, that's impacting geographically or, or wider with so many different stakeholders, how you could bring together a governance group or a leadership group that could then bring in that skill set in those particular areas as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, as you say, when you have a, a, a large project that will impact many people or potentially impact many people, that's why I said it's so key or important to have this stakeholder assessment. So at least from the company, we need to have a, they may have done their homework. Like, who do you see you may impact or who might have an interest regarding your project? You get a list and then you say, okay, 
you develop a, a protocol, a list of questions that you are going to ask these individuals. Uh, but when you go and engage with the people and ask them all the questions, what do you know about this company? What they are going to do? Do you have any fear or concern? You also need to ask these individuals, who else do we need to talk with? Because maybe the company gave you a short list and who should we engage? Who may have uh, 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 more fear about this situation? Who may have information? Uh, sometimes there is there is an ancestral knowledge that nobody saw and needs to be included. Uh, or sometimes uh, you have people that could block any decision or, or, or jeopardize mm -hmm. the process. And maybe they are more far away than the area that was defined as the project, but they will come in and 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 blow it up, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's that's important of this stakeholder engagement uh, assess or stakeholder assessment, and then you end up with a report or or an inform that reflects the views of all the parties without attributing um, uh, who said what. But this is the group, these are the concerns. This is the other group, these are the concerns. And you can, in, even in these interviews, uh, you can also get information about what might be a, a, a good outcome or good options that you can create to satisfy the interests of, of all these parties. Yeah. And, when you, and then you need to share this report with the people that you uh, interview. So people will be sure that you listen to them and you will ask, hey, am I missing something that you said? Am I including all, all the information, all your concerns, all your interests? And that exercise or that process uh, bring legitimacy to the facilitator, evaluator, mediator, as, uh, or the person who assess this process. Uh, and and they will, the people will trust, will have a little trust on this individual. Uh, and may have an opportunity to later on, if the right conditions are, uh, to facilitate the dialogue process. Right. I, um, I I come back to that that point as well about making sure you identify all of the stakeholders involved. Look, if if you leave some important stakeholders away from the discussion or out away from the table, the negotiation table, when they're left out. That can tend to come back and cost the organisation or the group or, or everyone involved a lot more. And, you know, as I said, some will say, look, for convenience sake, well, we've consulted with someone, you know, the, not meaningfully, but or, and they, they impart rights to about developing these particular projects. But if you lose someone out, this is where some of these deals, it's like uh, mergers, this is where some deals can unravel. It's the implementation. And when, you, as you said, uh, certain areas, pledges have been made and they're not carried through or they're broken, that breaks down trust. But the other issue, if no one's been consulted and they feel that their autonomy or some interests have been breached, they will resist or undermine the particular uh, approach as well. So uh, the long-term cost of overlooking and not engaging all stakeholders um, involved, identifying those people, could cost the uh, project uh, a lot more in the long term. Yeah, uh, and also in the early stages of development, uh, uh, how you could accelerate it by making sure early on that you engage those stakeholders. So, I've really enjoyed this discussion today, mm -hmm. Lewis, and uh, Me too. and we might 